Good morning, good afternoon. Of today, what's new in DMS WebCore 2.1? And of course, I'm very happy to see so um, many people today here for this webinar about WebCore 2.1. And um, to just to inform you in advance, we are going to solely focus on the new features in 2.1. So we assume already some knowledge about um, WebCore itself. Um, and if that's not the case, there are numerous recordings of previous WebCore sessions where you can learn everything about it. But today, today we focus just on what's new in 2.1. Also, don't hesitate during this webinar. That's why you're here live to ask questions. And for that, you can um, post your questions in the chat box here or also in the question box. If we refer to TM.1 and its uh, updates, what's new, it's sent several topics. First of all, the R it's RTL that uh, belongs to the pass to gs transpiler. The, compiler or transpiler that is responsible for converting or transpiling your object Pascal language to JavaScript and the RTL that goes with it. Focus here, of course, is on increasing Delphi language compatibility. New components that are added for 2.1 new component features, underlying framework improvements also the integration into the Delphi IDE, we did numerous improvements. We have also Miletus, which is our framework to create a native desktop application. Also there are uh, several improvements. improvements. And finally, I'm last but not least, also in the area of documentation, we did a lot of work for version 2.1. So first item here is the RTL update. And uh, for that, uh, we uh, integrate the latest what the past 2 gs team provides. Uh, and so for all the details uh, regarding what has been updated, improved, uh, fixed, you can uh, refer to this link where this information is covered. New components. We have uh, added several new components for 2.1. First is a DB aware edit button component. So the typical edit control additional button from where you can perform uh, additional actions. This control has been added a brand new component, which is the T web component, and that provides authentication and authorization via popular common uh, service from Apple, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, and also the Alt Zero initiative. The web responsive management is actually uh, that originated FNC component library is now directly integrated into TMS WebCore 2.1. So uh, usable when you have uh, just WebCore installed. A new input message dialog component to allow you to capture uh, various um, form of your applications. And the work has been uh, done um, in new controls, the web edit drop down table control and the DB aware version of it that offers a DB aware um, table control in a drop down picker. And we will cover this in detail during the webinar today. Having a brief look overview at what's new in, uh, with respect to component new features. Um, as I mentioned, a lot of work has been done table control and its drop down variant. Um, among these new features are the capability to have a header and footer with uh, various uh, options that you con can control for this being uh, filtering, searching, paging, um, with respect to uh, visualizing the table control, there is now automatic 
handling of uh, URLs, emails, images, um, just by setting a property and the grid does everything for you. Also, um, handling of um, the image and image width in the DB grid and also controlling column alignment has been added in this new version. We've also added additional control by CSS for styling uh, the menus, and that is the main menu and the pop-up menu. Asynchronous methods have been added in our dialogue components, so uh, you can write sequential code flows uh, thanks to these async methods. We have uh, improved the compatibility, the uh, interface class interface compatibility of the T Web Edit and the T Web Memo with um, these two methods, so that it behaves uh, exactly like it does in the VCL. So if you have existing VCL applications where you want to uh, port it to a web client, uh, this will uh, make your work easier. We've also added further CSS styling control in the T-Web page control component and the T-Web tab set component. And so, for example, you can better take advantage of um, bootstrap classes to uh, make these controls, the page control and the tab set control, um, look uh, and, and look like they are meant to uh, look in Bootstrap and uh, fit very well with the overall Bootstrap design of your page in case you, of course, decide to uh, use Bootstrap. And finally, there's also the timeout capability in the web wait message, so you can have it automatically um, disappear after a certain amount of milliseconds. Framework improvements. We did um, several improvements in the framework as well. And that includes um, support for um, alpha channel in the T color. So you can now do drawing code with uh, alpha transparency uh, using this alpha channel. At application level, we have also added two additional events that allow you to capture globally at application level exceptions and also have a, a point where you can catch when the user leaves your application, for example, by navigating to some other page or closing the browser, then the on exit event is triggered. And if there is anything to handle from there, you can easily do this. For increased compatibility with uh, JSON parsing, um, JSON parsing uh, that we allow you to do in uh, a way that is uh, code compatible with the JSON that is in the Delphi uh, RTL. And for that, we also introduced the TJSON bool class, which is in the Delphi RTL. And so that makes it uh, more convenient to reuse existing code, if that is the case, uh, from uh, VCLR. Uh, FMX applications to web core web client applications. In the area of uh, unit testing with web core, we also did several improvements. Uh, we um, improved the user interface of the uh, unit testing and we also extended the assert class with the optional messages that can be sent to the unit testing UI from these uh, classes. And finally, uh, several enumerators have been uh, added, uh, and one of these is in the uh, uh, JSON array, so you can uh, more easily loop through uh, JSON arrays from your code with simple four um, instance in JSON array do, and uh, it will loop over all the items in the JSON array. In terms of uh, IDE improvement, also there, we uh, did a lot of work. Uh, one of the things uh, we did is uh, add the uh, special property editor for the header in your web HTTP request component. And uh, this uh, already has uh, all commonly available uh, HTTP headers that you can set directly this way. So no longer you have to remember all these specific header um, 
possibilities or types that are possible for HTTP requests. You see them all in front of you when you open the header editor. We've also added in the library manager, the JavaScript library manager, um, directly support for Bootstrap 523, which is the latest version. And we have also uh, improved the live preview, but we will cover that shortly in uh, demos. The focus of this webinar is on uh, live coding and demos and uh, having a detailed look at uh, everything in action. Mylitus, which is our framework for creating uh, desktop applications, desktop applications for uh, Windows, Mac OS and Linux. And so also in the area of Mylitus, we did uh, several improvements, one of uh, which is that we have now a serverless Windows implementation uh, that makes it a lot faster to start and without any um, prompts, which um, typically come with it if you um, have an internal server running. And also we added the uh, capability to perform auto updating of Mylitus applications by simply providing a URL to the location of your update and the Mylitus application will update itself. Also, uh, finally, in the area of documentation, we did um, a, a huge step to uh, now bring our documentation online. And that means that uh, from the IDE, you can invoke the online help for components. Um, and that offers, uh, of course, the capability that we uh, extend, adapt, improve this uh, documentation all the time uh, without uh, requiring any effort from your site. What you see will always be live and will always be up to date. And that brings us to the interesting part of this um, webinar. Of course, um, everyone enjoys uh, looking at code, looking at demos, looking at the components directly out of the IDE. So let's switch now to our Delphi IDE. Here it is. And uh, first of all, if you look at the help menu about TMS Web Core, there you will see now that this is version 2.1. This is uh, a good check if you upgrade to 2.1 to see if it's the right version, the proper version that you have installed. And so what we are going to do first is um, having a look at the new message dialogues. And for that, I will add a button on the form. In the process, I can here show you uh, when I click uh, the context menu, the first item is online help. And then I have to bring the browser here in view on my dual monitor system. And here is the browser that is uh, opened here on the page for the web button where you see all its information and of course all the other web core components um, organized in the classic components in the DB aware uh, versions of it in the uh, jQuery um, web core components, uh, Electron and also Mylitus uh, components. All right, so we are going to have a look at uh, the message dialogues. Um, first of all, I'm going to uh, show you the classic approach, the approach that has been in PMS web core since the beginning. And so I can write in an ECL like style, um, the method message dialogue, and then the parameters that you expect, and the buttons we want on this dialogue. And let's do it this way to start with for the first time. So Let's compile and run this application. Meanwhile, I see there are already questions in um, the chat box. 
One of them is, is Delphi 11.3 supported? And the answer to that is yes. It was just release, released 11.3, but we can confirm that everything runs fine in uh, the latest 11.3. There is even the new uh, HTML editor in there uh, that uh, you can also take advantage of to edit your templates in a better way out of the IDE. So yes, 11.3 is supported and is of course a great IDE as um, excellent and improved performance. We recommend uh, to use that. It's just here on uh, the machine. Uh, we always use for uh, presenting these webinars that we just didn't have the time yet to install the latest 11.3. So this demo is um, running from 10.4. Um, for completeness, um, the Delphi versions from XC7 to 11.3 are supported to use um, TMS WebCore. So my message dialog, this is what you see standard out of the box and you can click uh, OK or cancel. But of course, the question here is how are we going um, to handle the result from this uh, message dialog? And this is, uh, of course, an, um, an asynchronous process in um, a web application. There is no concept of showing uh, something model that blocks the entire application or code flow. So that is an, uh, something that is not available within the scope of uh, web client applications. The browser actually wants to ensure that there is never blocking code and that uh, the user interface is always responsive. So how are we going to do that in that case? The classic method that was available ever since um, WebCore was released is by using, for example, an anonymous method that I can write uh, this way. The method that is called when the dialog is closed. And from here, I can write something similar to this. And here I set the caption. And the caption in this case is actually the same as you would have in an official application. It is the um, caption of the browser app that you are using for uh, opening this window or application. So here I add a simple handler for uh, when a message dialog button is clicked. I see, meanwhile, also another question in the chat box. Is 2.1 also available for Visual Studio Code? So um, for those not uh, knowing, we have WebCore that can be used from the Delphi IDE, but we have also a version of WebCore that you can use directly from Visual Studio Code. And the nice thing about that is that you can use Visual Studio Code from uh, Windows, from Mac, and also from Linux. And so the answer is at this moment for Visual Studio Code, we have version 205. And uh, it is expected that shortly after we released um, WebCore 2.1 for Delphi, we will also update the version for Visual Studio Code. So expect that very fast after we have released um, WebCore for Delphi. So I bring back my browser window to this monitor and I click um, on the message dialog and now I answer OK. And you can see here in the caption of my browser tab that um, it gets the proper response. So that is something that was possible uh, ever since WebCore was uh, released. Now, let me show you how you can uh, handle this in, with the new promise-based functions. And so I add the button here, and I will actually copy this one and change a little bit to the promise-based version, which is the async. And uh, so it's called message dialog async. And 
a couple of things I need to do. I need to mark this method as async. So every method that um, contains code with uh, promises, with this type of handlers, um, we need to mark with the attribute async. And at that moment, we can use the await construct and get something like this. So, let's go here to properly end this one. And I can write this variable to get my answer. Okay. And then I can set variable equals my promise that I'm waiting for. And then I can copy and paste this. Oops. Let's copy and paste this code like this. And as you can see, for uh, developing the flow of my code, th this is uh, way more convenient. And the await construct is taking care that um, the UI in the browser stays at all times responsive. So there is no blocking at all with await. It is just uh, staying responsive. So let's bring my browser back to the proper screen. Here it is. And so now I call this dialog and you can see that it behaves exactly the same way, but the style of coding I think is way more convenient. Another question, meanwhile, in the chat box, are the anonymous method signatures you can use documented in the online help? Um, I suggest, I assume that uh, you mean uh, the signature that you specify the response. Um, that is something we need to double check, but indeed uh, it, it's um, desirable that this is uh, documented. I will just double check. Um, to see if the team indeed um, added these result types so you immediately we know how you need to write your await code. All right, now let me also, in connection with this, introduce something about Bootstrap. So now this is all without any custom CSS. And from here, I can invoke uh, if I right click on the project, manage JavaScript uh, libraries. And that gets me uh, the following dialog. And here you can see all the uh, JavaScript libraries that you can pick that we have already uh, included. You can add your own references to custom JavaScript libraries. So if you click this dialog, you can add a link um, and here you can switch between a link to a CSS file or a JavaScript file. And, um, and here you can add the um, URL to this uh, file. And you can also add attributes for uh, the link that will get added to your project HTML file. As I have here now um, checked the built-in Bootstrap 5 library, and I press OK. If I now open my project HTML file, and I go in the code view, the first time it opens somewhat slow in here, in here, but here it is. So here you can see what this managed JavaScript libraries has actually inserted in your project HTML file to ensure that the proper files for Bootstrap uh, 5, in this case, are added to your HTML file. By doing this, uh, it is not sufficient to have also my message dialogues using the Bootstrap style. What I need to do is um, switch the CSS library to Bootstrap at form level. And once I did that and run the application, when you invoke the message dialog function, it will pick up the form 
CSS library and it will use uh, Bootstrap if you have the Bootstrap library included. And then your dialogue looks this way, uh, which is, I believe, uh, much, much uh, nicer. Also, um, a good tip that I can give you is uh, if you want to style components with Bootstrap styles, uh, you can do this from the element class name uh, properties. A button has only one place where you can specify the Bootstrap class for via the element class name. But if you have set your CSS library to Bootstrap, any new control you insert, like in web edit, will already have its element class name preset to the expected Bootstrap style. So that saves you from knowing in the first place what style you should use. And secondly, for specifying it, of course, if I now add a new button, you will see that the default element class name became button, button light, which is a standard bootstrap class name to make your button look uh, like a nice bootstrap button. All right, and this brings us to um, the first demo that I wanted to show you here to save uh, our coding time. Um, and this is about the input dialog. So I pick up this new demo that is uh, included in version 2.1. And here it is. This is the demo for the uh, input message dialog. So um, if we briefly go to the code, then you will see several, several variations of this uh, input message dialog. First of all, there's the classic uh, method, the classic method, um, where you have your anonymous method to handle the results. Here, we have the promise-based implementation, which is identical to the message dialog. And here we have an, another variant, which is based on using a component, drop that component on the form, and then you can either also invoke a uh, promise-based uh, await uh, construct, or alternatively, if you have used the component, the component is here on the form, this component also has an on-close event, and also from there you can process the result of um, what you entered. If we have a look at this uh, component, you will see that, um, well, first of all here, you can already see several class names, and this is uh, several class names for several parts of this dialog that you can uh, style. And here, uh, standard bootstrap style classes are specified to make your uh, input dialog look in the proper bootstrap style. But what we have in addition to the uh, regular message dialog component is the input type and the input value the input type. Here you can see all kinds of inputs that you can select from uh, to um, get from the user in the user interface some uh, specific value. It can be a time, a number, a text, a password, all these kind of things. And here uh, you either get or set the value that the user entered uh, via this property. So if we uh, have a look at that in action, let's run this uh, demo. Here it is. Okay. So here with this uh, list box, we simply set uh, what type of input we want to capture. Here we set the style of this dialog message in this input dialog and here we can invoke it here we can set for example pressing enter and you see here the captured value if i use the asynchronous method i can do exactly the same just my code flow is uh, way more uh, understandable or convenient to use if i now switch to a date for example 
and get the input. This way we get a drop down calendar in our components. Or if we specify a password and then we can see that if we enter the password, it's shown this way. Notice that when, for example, I set this to date and get the date, this is the standard browser built in uh, date picker. So um, that means that it should have the look and feel that the browser has defined as a standard look and feel for the operating system where it runs on. So this will look um, different on different operating systems, different browsers. It is uh, the standard HTML input for a date that is used in this uh, input dialog. Before we move on, um, I'm having a look at the chat box for questions. Um, and where can I see? Okay. Does the browser affect the async if the page becomes minimized or loses focus? Uh, no, I have, I'm not aware that um, what happens to the browser would affect your uh, async handling code. Next question is how friendly is the TMS web core with CSS grid? Um, actually, our table control is next on in this webinar, so you will be able to see it for yourself, what you can do with the table control, which is um, one of the possibilities to uh, show grid in a tabular form, but we also have uh, a string grid and DB grid, so plenty of options that are built in in um, WebCore. We'll have a look at that um, in a moment. Other question is, uh, I think this is a quite um, technical question. I have a product, pro a project that uses Bootstrap sometimes when I run the project dialogues and message dialogues to not load the Bootstrap style. Uh, any hints? Um, I would, uh, in the first place, uh, double check that you have the Bootstrap uh, libraries um, the CSS and JavaScript library properly and always loaded directly from your project HTML file. Um, if for some reason um, it persists, I suggest to contact our support. And then another question is uh, the webinar recorded for the people who are a little bit late. Yes, the good news is that this uh, webinar is being recorded, so you will be able to um, check it, check the beginning if you uh, missed uh, from the start. Okay, so this was it with respect to the message dialogue and message input dialogue, where the input dialogue is brand new and the asynchronous uh, handling is also new. Let's have a look now at an IDE integration for the web HTTP requests, the component that takes care of performing HTTP GET, PUT, POST, DELETE uh, requests. And so here, the headers property is the place where you specify headers that you should use um, to get the proper effect or result from your HTTP requests. And so now you can see that you get this uh, dialogue. And so from here, you can, for example, immediately see what possibilities there are and um, you can fill in the value. So if you would respect a JSON response uh, that is not cached, this is, for example, how you would do it. Um, so we think way more convenient to specify the header like that. And that brings us to the um, web table control that also got significantly uh, improved. So let's uh, have a look around this uh, new version of the table control. Uh, and I drop it on the form like this. Let's make it a little bit bigger. And what we are going to do is add some data in this table control. So first of all, what's new? Well, we have the new footer and header property. So I can set the header here and make it visible. So it's uh, by default, not visible. So you can see now I made the header visible 
and I can also set the footer visible. And you can see several options that you can set both for uh, header and footer. And so uh, one of the options is to have a filter input. So you can uh, filter on a specific column. Here you set the uh, column filter. You can also uh, have a search input if you enable this uh, to search for specific uh, data in specific cells in the table control. And you can have that uh, in either the header or the footer or in both. Uh, that's uh, up to your decision. And also a pager here, you can specify what pager type you want to have in your either header or footer. Paging itself is covered by this uh, paging property. So here you enable or disable the paging and uh, also the size of your pages. Okay. So, uh, and further in the options, there are several new options. For example, automatically render the emails with an email hyperlink. Do the same for URLs. Uh, immediately render images when these are returned as data. Automatically perform um, right aligned numbers and left aligned texts. Control the cell border color and all these things turn borders on and off. Uh, these are all things that you can now do um, out of the box with the table control. But let's uh, use this uh, table control with some data. And so for this uh, data, uh, we are using here today uh, sample data. And let us have a look at the source of this uh, data. I need to open a new browser tab for that. Here it is. And I'm not sure. Okay, it is successful. So, um, well, let's capture this one and let's navigate to it for your understanding. So this is an, uh, a web service that actually re uh, returns dummy JSON data. Uh, it is very convenient for testing your uh, applications. If you uh, do not have your backend ready yet, uh, here you can see um, the various endpoints that you can call in this dummy JSON service. And as far as I know, it's uh, all free. Um, so a great place if you do not have your backend uh, ready yet to get some JSON data from. And so this here is uh, an endpoint where I just get some random uh, users from this service. And this is the exact um, endpoint that we are going to use in the demo. So what I'm going to do here is load my table with this information. And we can do this by calling uh, load from JSON, and then I need to add the URL. This is the URL for this endpoint. And actually, there is, uh, I see this uh, parameter is already set correct. So it has a second parameter. And you will understand if I show you here uh, this uh, JSON, you can see that uh, the response is organized under a node uh, users. So that's why I specify here as the node under which my data is in the second parameter of um, load from JSON. Okay, I believe that my code is correct this way. Let's just see the initial results when doing that. Let's compile this uh, application. I see meanwhile that uh, there is another question. Can you add custom headers? Yes, you can press uh, insert on this header editor and uh, that inserts a new line. Um, from this new line, you can set your uh, requests, your uh, header information yourself. So this is my table. I 
click on load from JSON and you can see here that um, the information was loaded in the table control at this moment not so pretty yet so let's do some uh, additional stuff to make it already somewhat more pretty so what I'm going to do is uh, the following I will first of all make the rendering somewhat nicer by setting in the options uh, automatically render email URL do the numeric alignment I will also specify the width I will keep the uh, image width uh, a little bit small you can see here uh, it's not yet it's not included here let me have a look at the uh, URL okay it's the last one but I know why I need to let the table control auto size so that it fits for whatever data is in this um, table control I will also enable uh, vertical scrolling and let's see what this uh, already brings there is a question uh, can we use SQL to get data well the data actually comes from a backend so it's typically in your backend uh, that you will implement uh, the SQL to return uh, your response as JSON and so here is the result uh, with the rendering of the email URL uh, here uh, is the images that were also automatically uh, rendered and you can see we have a header we have a footer and um, now we have no paging so all uh, records are shown in this uh, table control the moment that I enable paging like this and make a pager available for example in my header and let's use a link based uh, pager and then let's have a look at the result of this question here is can the header and footer be fixed in the table control it is uh, not fixed uh, if you want to have a fixed uh, header or footer then we recommend to use the db grid uh, that is um, designed for that purpose that has a non-scrolling uh, fixed area so here is my result and yeah I see that I um, selected that my pager is available in the footer but it can be the header as well it's a little bit difficult to see uh, this way um, I will immediately show you a better example um, but this is uh, with just setting a property uh, having a pager in your table control now this is the table control out of the box without any um, settings for styling it we can of course use uh, bootstrap to uh, make that uh, look way nicer and that's also where i prepared this demo for so let's have a look at the demo that will be using bootstrap and i will show you uh, here that the uh, element header class name is used the element table class name is used so these are CSS classes from Bootstrap to make that grid um, display way nicer. Also notice here that we have the DB aware table control and that means that it is connected to a data source that is in turn connected to a data set. And the data set is actually connected to the same source. So this dummy JSON endpoint and um, here I'm adding absolutely no code. So the only thing is hap that is happening is setting this property active to true. That means that the web client connection with will perform the request to get the data from the dummy JSON endpoint. It will fetch the data, fill the data set with the data from uh, JSON. 
and uh, via the data source that is coupled to uh, your web table control, this table control is filled. What I did in addition to this is uh, have a checkbox to allow you to set the paging on and off. And here from the user interface, you can select different kinds of um, pager controls. What I also added here is the DB aware drop down table control. So here we have a, a drop down, and from the drop down, we'll see a table. The table properties in this drop down are organized under table options. And so you see that also here, of course, you have a footer header paging. Um, and what we have is the table source. So the table in this drop down can be uh, data driven. And also the edit control has the data source. It's not used here in this example, but you can make the edit control DB aware. Let's have a look when I compile and run this application, how this result looks like, especially also uh, by using Bootstrap to make everything look way nicer. So here it comes in the browser. And so in the browser, it looks like this. So here you can see, I also enabled here in the header, the search and the filtering. And here you can see the bootstrap styled uh, paging. Paging is enabled. So I have 10 uh, rows and I can uh, with this uh, button select the page in my table control and i can also select different styles for um, navigating the pages in this uh, table control when i now would do something like filtering uh, and filtering is here set to column three the gender column and so here uh, i'm not sure why it is behaving like this let's just uh, restart it and like mail and filter on mail now you can see i have only two pages left and obviously i only have um, the rows that have the mail uh, people and this way i unfilter if i now um, search for um, some information and this is a column independent here in this case i search for Strucker. you can see here that it found the result in uh, page 30 in uh, row 30 page 3 so it searches across the uh, pages in the table control and the same is actually available from this drop down so here i have the connection between the edit uh, part and the drop down table i have set this to the last name column so that means if i pick something from this column um, it is the value that is used and uh, that where you pick from but everything that is possible in the table control is also possible in this uh, drop down variant I see a question here, does paging also load the data on demand? So um, with this implementation here connected to the data set, the data set is filled with all the information and it is the uh, communication between the table control and the data set that will uh, do the work to get page by page from the data set. If uh, you are not doing this through a data set, you can indeed manually um, perform the requests to your endpoint to get uh, only information from one page at a time. And you would do that from the event here, the event on select page. The, so from this event, you could, for example, invoke uh, or perform the HTTP request to your endpoint specifying the rows that you will need for the new page that uh, is visualized. And uh, with this uh, implementation, you really get an on-demand uh, paged table control. 
I just want to um, briefly bring under your attention uh, the flexibility of this uh, drop-down control. Uh, so what you have seen now is an um, edit drop-down table control and the DB aware edit drop-down table control. But actually, if you have a look at the drop-down controls, there is also, um, and I will actually pick the editable part, edit drop-down control. And so how does this work? This is the picker, drop-down picker. And what I can do is, for example, something like this. And add an edit control and also button control to this panel like this. And what I can do then is assign the panel to this drop down, and that is sufficient to create your custom variant of a drop down control with. A the control you like and possibly also the code that you want to use in connection with that. So this is my drawdown and as you can see here you have your panel from this drawdown control and any code you want to add to that um, feel free to uh, add it. All right. I also mentioned improvements in the area of uh, my litus. So again, Miletus is the technology to create desktop applications from this web technology. And what I actually did was just pick the code that I created for the DB edit table control demo and just drop that code into a Miletus application. So here you have your Miletus application from here you would add your targets um, being um, also Mac and Linux and um, you can see that it is exactly the same code in this application and as such when I uh, compile this and run this you will get a uh, Windows executable here in this case a Windows executable that will run as I mentioned now in WebCore 2.1, this is a serverless solution. So um, when you initially run this, you see no warnings anymore from uh, Windows and it also normally starts uh, faster. And here is the um, demo now in a native um, Windows application. And here I can select my various navigators. The only thing that was not added here is the bootstrap style, but that is also something that you can add and it will have the same uh, look and feel in a native application. All right. And um, what's also new in Miletus is this auto updating. I also want to briefly touch that it is surfaced by an uh, component, the Miletus update component, a non-visual component. So this component, you put it on the form and here you put the URL to the information about uh, new versions of your application. When your Miletus application starts, it will first check this uh, the content found at this URL. And if this points to a newer version, it will download this newer version and replace the running executable uh, by the new version. And this is the case on um, Windows, Linux and Mac, of course. Um, your URL with the Windows version uh, will be different typically from the URL with your Mac version so that people do not get and a Mac version on a Windows machine and vice versa. All right, also mentioned in the list of new components built into 2.1 is the responsive manager. The responsive manager 
as a technique to create responsive applications in a um, uh, visual way. And I will briefly show this uh, concept by dropping the responsive manager, which is a non-visual component on the form. And let's assume that we are first of all creating something very basic for a mobile application. And so mobile application smartphones, that means that um, I have only a uh, small screen. And then in this small screen, ideally, for example, I have some uh, button controls to uh, print. Uh, I have this in the top area of my form. Now, this might not be the ideal way to uh, represent your application on a desktop machine that has a uh, way larger screen. So what I can do is I uh, save this to a state. And so this will be, I can give these states a name. Uh, the states is here, the collection of states in my responsive manager uh, component. And you can see here that I can give this a name. So this could be mobile, for example. Now, when I make this um, way larger for, for desktop, for example, it might be more suitable that I have a um, left aligned control panel. And so what I do is actually save this to a new state. And so you see in the collection of states that a new state is here and I name this desktop. So I can now, for example, navigate here to um, the mobile state. Uh, I think I made a mistake now by um, yeah, I made a mistake because I saved it and I should have loaded it. So I need to do this task again. I set it to top aligned, of course, for um, mobile. I save it back to uh, the mobile state. And what I do now is um, from here, load the desktop state. And you can see now, this is how it looks in uh, desktop. And I do load from the mobile state. So this is how it should look in mobile state. And this is how from the IDE you can design completely different looking uh, forms for either mobile desktop or uh, different sizes in between and uh, design it. And then when you run this application, the responsive manager will uh, deal with uh, the size itself and will take the proper um, state for the proper device where your web application is running on. And we can uh, easily see this from this application. So I expect that this will open as a desktop application, which it uh, does. And if I, and I can see now that I can not make it small enough uh, for um, showing it in mobile state, but by opening the browser console, uh, I can simulate this. So, so you can see that if I make it small enough, it uh, converts to the mobile style. If I make it larger, it converts to the um, desktop way of presenting my application. Um, somewhat more uh, complex example is also uh, among the new uh, demos. So the demos are all to be found under demo. And then we have the various categories and we go here under basic, under responsive manager and here we have the new included responsive manager demo that is a tiny bit more sophisticated than what I have here put quickly together. So here is my responsive manager and you can see here that I have four states. So this is the smallest state and then I have three more states for 
uh, larger screens. Uh, okay, let's run this demo. That will make it visible right away. Okay, here is the demo. And now you can clearly see as I resize that um, I'm getting different layouts. So it's the left aligned panel, then it's the top aligned panel with the big buttons. Then we get to a smaller variant with uh, smaller buttons. And for the very small screens, um, the buttons cannot even be in one row anymore then you could uh, lay out them in the following way. So, um, and of course, this is all done without writing any code. The only thing that you need to do is um, use that responsive manager, create, design your forms for different states, save what you have designed, and the responsive manager will uh, deal by itself uh, to show you the proper state for the proper form factor. And a an final area that I wanted to cover today is the new web vault component. Here's the demo for the web vault component. And so the web vault component allows you to easily integrate with um, authentication and authorization provided by services like Google, Microsoft, Apple, also Facebook and Alt Zero at this moment. So this is uh, the new component, Web Alt. It uses the latest uh, authentication authorization or sign-in libraries from uh, different services. And here you can see the different services supported. So there's Apple, Alt Zero, Facebook, Google, Microsoft. And when you open these, you can see that uh, with setting visible to true, um, the sign-in buttons from these services become visible automatically by itself um, when you uh, enable this. So you can select with what alternative authentication mechanisms you can authenticate within the scope of your web core application. And, um, if we have a look at the code, that is something that we can't share because these are uh, private keys. Um, so here we have um, keys that are set for uh, Google. So that is actually a key that you have to request from Google on the uh, sign-in library uh, page. The same for Facebook, Apple, uh, Altero and Microsoft. Well, here, this uniquely identifies your web application as an application um, where these services can be used for to sign in. Um, I cannot uh, run this directly from here because uh, using these sign in authentication services require that you run them from an HTTPS enabled domain. So from here, it renders, but it won't work properly. To make it work properly, we deployed this uh, demo on this uh, URL. So actually, you can try this also now from your machine. So I'm not sure why. Okay, there it is. So now it's running from our HTTPS domain. And so when I perform sign in with Google, for example, it has detected that I'm signed in known to uh, Google as myself. And I can select this as the account to log in with in the web core application. And by that process, Google, for example, enables that it also picks up your avatar and you can also expose or decide not to expose your uh, email address. So this is what Google offers. Not all services offers the same, but the key idea is that at least some name, uh, if even if it's an alias is returned, 
but also more importantly, a unique ID. And it is that ID with which you can identify the user in your web core application, for example, for storing specific data that belongs to the user. And so I can do the same from Microsoft, for example. Let's try again. I'm not sure why it is not reacting to uh, logging in with Microsoft. Let's maybe retry. When we are streaming here for this webinar, the internet is at sometimes somewhat slow. And I'm not sure why it is not picking up here with Microsoft. Let's maybe try Apple, but we won't do Apple here because Apple has two-factor uh, authentication enabled. And so that means that I would need to um, use my smartphone uh, to get through this. Uh, and this is a little bit inconvenient during this webinar, but you get the ID. Um, to show you in the application itself, um, Let's have a look again at this web alt component. Here you can see the various um, events that are triggered when the user went through the uh, sign-in um, phase. And so um, from there, for example, in the Google uh, sign-in, you can see that it returns the Google user data. We only get here a name an email and the avatar URL, but most importantly for uh, dealing with your own uh, data and storing the data belonging to the user that signed in, you will want to use the ID that is a unique identifier um, that is passed along with Google. And so that means that you could create for your uh, users of WebCore applications uh, the ability to sign in with these various services and save your users from uh, creating a new account with your application. And with that account comes the typical uh, entering your new um, uh, username and password. And uh, we all know the story that uh, you, at some point you end up with like hundreds of passwords and forget them all the time. Uh, this is a way to um, identify sign in with an existing account and uh, forget about all the uh, new passwords that you need to create all the time. So this is uh, also a new component available out of the box in your um, WebCore 2.1. And that uh, concludes the overview that I prepared for today for um, what's new in WebCore 2.1. And um, let's first maybe take some time to uh, have a look at questions. Uh, let me have a look where I should pick up with questions. Is it correct to say that the FNC table grid components would supersede what I'm seeing here? Um, as always, um, one important um, thing for us is freedom of choice. And so uh, we... Um, thought it was important. There was also uh, a request from uh, various users to uh, add more capabilities out of the box in the table control and the uh, string grid DB grid. Uh, so that's what we did and, and we make them stronger. But indeed, uh, there is also the possibility that you use the FNC grid within a uh, web core application. Um, that's also a possibility, but we do not uh, want to force you to uh, use a specific um, grid or do not want to force that you get FNC in addition to uh, WebCore. So um, freedom of choice. And there is uh, still, of course, a third option that is that you use an existing uh, JavaScript library for um, editing your data in a tabular form. Actually, uh, our friend and good uh, colleague uh, Andrew uh, created a blog series um, about using the tabulator JavaScript uh, library, which is uh, another alternative if uh, that's your preference. Uh, we strongly believe in the freedom of choice. Um, and 
and yeah, it's the, the choice is up to you. We do not want to uh, impose any choice uh, for you. We just think it's important that um, what we surface, what we cover, uh, that we make it uh, better and stronger all the time. Is the data editable? The table control is a uh, control for presenting data. If you need editable data, this is what you can do out of the box with the DB grid, um, DB grid connected to a uh, data set via data source is um, editable. Can we define the breakpoints for each of the states? Uh, this must refer to the web responsive manager. And this web responsive manager will trigger an event as the state changes uh, caused by the resizing of your browser, for example, or when the initial state is selected depending on your form or your screen uh, size. And so from this uh, web responsive manager event, you can get the information about the selected state and uh, you can do a programmatic custom, further custom actions depending on uh, the state. So that is something that you can use. Okay, this was a suggestion for um, the issue with Microsoft. We'll need to have a look at that in detail um, after this webinar, why this um, didn't work out of the box here right away, but um, we'll take that up. Um, another suggestion here is to um, specify or use a login with Sphinx. That is something that we uh, need to have a look at. But if that provides the same kind of sign-in authentication functionality, uh, that should indeed uh, work. And, and then uh, a question about um, the, um, the replay. Uh, yes, as soon as we have uh, captured the recording and prepared it to uh, make it available in YouTube for replay, um, we will actually send out the link to the replay to all the users registered for this webinar. So expect this in your mailbox, uh, most likely tomorrow. Another question is um, how to deal with renew ID. Um, I'm not sure about this question. I should um, have a closer look at that with my colleague who uh, worked on the web alt, but as far as I personally know, uh, once you get a Google, Microsoft, Facebook, or whatever uh, ID, um, it's my understanding that that ID is uh, fixed. Okay, and then uh, Holger answers that the ID stays the, st stays the same, which is indeed what I had assumed. Um, but we will double check to be 100% sure, but at this moment, it is what I would assume. Can we see a full Sphinx integration demo? Um, good suggestion about Sphinx. I'll take that up with my colleague. We'll see how closely this matches the patterns found in Facebook, Microsoft, Apple and Google. If that matches the pattern, I think it should be fairly easy to also pick up that sign-in procedure. Uh, personally, I had not heard about uh, Sphinx myself, at least in the context of um, um, sign-in. And so uh, we'll need to see that. I see uh, greetings for um, Michel Thierry, uh, who is looking forward to see us in Bruges indeed. I should mention this, that on May 11 and May 12, we have two days of training. So think about um, two full days with uh, content like this interaction. Um, we are open to all your questions. You are free to address uh, the entire team and uh, ask questions uh, of all kinds. And uh, of course, on uh, these training days, We'll cover WebCore, but we will also cover 
uh, VCL components, the best components for creating X database servers, ORM, and all these things. Also, our uh, own Sphinx libraries. And, um, and now, indeed, um, this rings a bell that, of course, you were. Um, let me have a look at the chat box. Sure. Um, this, of course, um, I was actually confused with the Nginx Linux, uh, but it refers, of course, to TMS Sphinx, which is the authentication sign-in uh, library that is part of TMS BIS. And indeed, this uh, is in the works. You will uh, expect that to come uh, a full integration with uh, Sphinx. Um, what more do we have? Um, I saw a token property in the components, so I would as assume that ID stays and only the token changes. Uh, that is correct. However, greetings also to, also to Ivan, uh, with who we have regular contact. I say hi to Brazil and hi to Ivan. Thank you for your kind uh, remarks. How to access the TMS trainings? Um, I can show you, actually, I can, let's bring up the page for this. And here it is. So at this URL, you can find all the information about our upcoming training days. So visit tmstrainingdays.com to get more info. I want to warn you at this time that um, places have been going very fast. We have the um, early bird discount price till March 15, and we have at this very moment only 10 places left. The places are limited because of the uh, special location that we selected. So if you want to be part of this um, event, um, hurry, get your early bird discount and get one of these last approximately 10 places. Um, we will also uh, actually, um, the aim is to capture all the content of these uh, training days and also make them available at a later time online via courses.landgraph.dev. And I see Thomas Kieswurm, who will also be in Bruges. We are, of course, very much looking forward to you to see you there. And uh, if there are no more questions, um, what's next? Of course, um, we will uh, release TMS WebCore if nothing goes wrong next week. 2.1, the beta has been out for a while. We captured all the feedback, worked on it, polished it. Uh, but if nothing goes wrong, expect 2.1 for Delphi next week. And then the next task we'll work on is um, make the update for Visual Studio Code so that uh, components and framework are 100% at the same level. Um, but what's after 2.1? Of course, you are in control. And so let us know what you want to see uh, moving forward after 2.1. And uh, we'll... Uh, Look forward to your feedback and we are eager to work on um, the exciting ideas that you are coming up with. There is also a question, meanwhile, is there a way to export the grid to a CSV file? So indeed, you can invoke and uh, download a CSV from the uh, table control um, that's a uh, built-in method. For quite a bit of questions, uh, so, thanks a lot for your attention, thanks for your time, thanks also for all the feedback that we got during the beta stage. If you're playing with 2.1 beta, take the opportunity for the last few days to send whatever um, feedback, comments, uh, wishes, etc. And so, uh, from now on, we work hard towards the release next week. So um, I would say see you next week and maybe see, uh, see you in Bruges on our training days.
have a further remaining excellent day. Enjoy Delphi coding and see you on a next webinar too. Thanks for your time and bye-bye.